Good morning. I'd like to greet everyone in the name of Jesus. Let me just shut that all the way. Is it? Stop a little bit of the draft. Well, let's pray. Let's stand up to pray. <clears throat> Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, Lord. Let your kingdom come, and let your will be done here on earth, in, in our lives, in our families, in our actions, in our conversation, just, just as your will would be done if we were in heaven. We thank you, God, for your provision so far, and we seek your hand for our daily bread, for us and the brethren around the world. We ask, God, that you would forgive us our sins in the same way that we would forgive others, and that you would lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from Satan and his workers. Thank you for this good day, God. Guide us now as we look at the scriptures and see some stuff and and hear a warning. Just pray that you would guide me, my thoughts. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to start preaching through the book of Hebrews. Um, So we're going to start, basically, I'm just going to read Hebrews chapter 1, and we're going to just briefly talk about it, but I, something during Nicholas's message came to my mind that I just want to just touch, and it kind of blends in with this, but here, the book of Hebrews, um, we don't know for sure who wrote it. Is that echoing? Is that all right, the sound? Okay. Um, Some people think Paul wrote it. Some people think Brother Barnabas wrote it. That whoever wrote it is not very necessary to know. What, What is necessary to know is that there are some serious warnings in this book, and they can be understood. When I was an evangelical, this was the book that... um, all of my professors would would say something similar to this. Oh, that book of Hebrews, it's it is the pinnacle of the knowledge of God. It's the hardest one to understand, and in fact, that's why we just rarely teach out of it because it's it is so far beyond us. We just don't understand what it says. And the reason why is because it's very clear that in life uh, you sow and you reap, we we live and we do actions and there's consequences for those. I mean, and in this book in particular, he is writing, I think, to, to Jews or those who have Hebrew backgrounds. Um, and remember, in this time of the early church, the, there was these Judaizers who were coming in and infiltrating and say they believe Jesus is the Messiah, but we need to do this in the Mosaic Law, and we need to do this in the Mosaic Law, and this and this. And they were beginning to slide back in. And I don't know if the writer of this is, is addressing that or if he's also addressing just those who may be interested in, in following Christ but don't quite understand how Christ works with, with how they viewed God and the Old Testament law and what their concept was of the Messiah who was going to come. And, and all that stuff is cleared up in this book. Um, and what he does right away here in chapter 1 is he, he makes it very clear that Jesus is the Son of God. I mean, that is what he's doing right away in chapter 1. And, and why is that important? Well, for the Jewish or the Hebrew-minded person, when they heard what Jesus said, it was like, this is the opposite of what I knew growing up in the Mosaic Law. Jesus said, you've heard it was said of old, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, there's no reason to be angry at all. And so, 
the writer here is proving that Jesus and what he taught is not just um, good to hear and, and interesting and something to consider as a way, but that this is the actual words of God and that it's not something that needs to be taken lightly, but it, it is the fulfillment of all of what God was, was aiming for through the teachings of the Old Testament. And that's why he goes through this. And that's, that's why he does this. And I just, it just is, Hebrews is one of my most beloved books because after I converted, if you will, um, and stopped following Calvin, started just following Jesus, the book of Hebrews was just opened up. It just made complete sense. It wasn't really hard at all. If you really believe that God expects us to obey him, it's very clear. Uh, so anyways, I just, it's just a real blessing. So let's go ahead and I'm just going to read. This time I'm going to read and just mention some things as we go through. Not spend a lot of time here because I, I think uh, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, chapter 1. Uh, Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by a Son. Jesus, that's Jesus. Whom He appointed heir of all things. Through whom He also created the worlds. He, this Son, this Jesus from Nazareth, who preached the kingdom of God, He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. That just that phrase right there is so amazing. I I don't this is out of the NRSV translation, which is which is very uh, academic and very close to word for word. In fact, when Nicholas was giving his definitions, his definitions were like the same word that you know, and in, in there was like endurance and stuff. And but this the exact imprint of God's very being. Well, what was that imprint? Jesus came and he said, I've come to tell you what God wants you to know and live, and I, I am here to tell you it. And he taught this thing, and that, that way that Jesus lived, that's the very imprint of God, of the divine nature. And that in Peter, in 2 Peter, I think, it says that we become partakers that's, that's this. He, Jesus, is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And He, Jesus, sustains all things by His powerful Word. When He had made purifications for sins after He died, and rose again, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So you can see that, that the writer here is, is showing um, that there should be, should be no doubt because this Jesus is the Son of God, the, the very image of the Godhead, and what he should be listened to. It's not just like, well, he was just a really nice rabbi, and we appreciate him, and wish we wouldn't, you know, our fellow countrymen wouldn't have killed him. No, that, that's what he's clear. He, he was greater than that. He was the Messiah. <clears throat> the, the exact imprint... God's very being. So what should that tell us? It should tell us that what he spoke should be listened to. And it should be heard and obeyed. And, and that there, sh there shouldn't even be a debate. Like if we were outside and we 
somebody was, somebody was here and they said, I have the power of God. And then they were just like, boom, and they picked up my old big school bus and just somehow threw it. I mean, we would listen to that person. It would be so frightening, we would just know within us, we need to listen to that person. There's some power there. It's the same way. But this is even more because this is the very imprint of God. And it, lest these readers of this letter might think, well, the angels, I mean, Michael, Gabriel, I mean, those are the archangels, they're the cherubim, they're high, and that Jesus may be underneath there, and there may be just, there may be a little bit of the writer here addressing some Gnostic stuff coming in, like the Gnostics believe that there was this main God, and then there was these other gods, and then there was this Demiurge, and then he at Jesus. Okay, so if he is, I can see how him saying that he is above all the angels. That that just clears all that up. He's not he's not just this thing that was just, you know, the next thing down the line, the next thing to bring the message from the little demiurge and all that stuff. No, he is. He is one with God. And so he just over and over establishes this. And then he gives proofs here. Verse 5. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? Or again, and he quotes, I will be his father, and he will be my son. And again, he begins, uh, it, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, quote, Let all God's angels worship him. Verse 7, Of the angels, God says, or he says, he makes, his, quote, he makes his angels wing, winds and his servants flames of fire. But of his son, he says, quote, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and your righteous scepter is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your Companions, end quote. Verse 10, quote, In the beginning, Lord, you have founded the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like clothing. Like the cloth, you will roll them up, and like clothing, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will never end. Verse 13. But to which of the angels has he ever said this? Quote, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies of your footstool. He hasn't said that to any of the angels. Are not all angels spirits in the divine service sent to serve for the sake of those who shall inherit salvation? So, his point is here, the angels are servants of God to help us, man, those who might inherit eternal salvation. And so, he goes on from here, and what, what I think is just really wonderful about this book of Hebrews is he, he starts here that Jesus is God, he was the creator, and then he goes from that, and then he starts talking about the law of Moses, or, or the children of Israel that they came out, he presents beliefs, and we're going to go through this as time goes on, and I get opportunities to share, but, but he, he clears up almost every issue of doctrine that we would have today, that, the, that those who would call themselves Christians, uh, but don't believe that you have to do what Jesus says. He immediately deals with belief. Like, okay, you say you believe in God. And see, the Israelites believed in God, but they didn't really believe because they didn't obey his commandments. And the whole point of this book is walk in the commandments that Jesus has given. I mean, over and over again. Turn to John chapter 7. This, this just lines up again. You know, I think... Uh, Jesus, when he was here, he dealt with this subject. John 7, verses 16. Then Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but he who sent me. Anyone who resolves to do the will of God 
will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking of my own. And then if you go down to um, halfway in verse 28, this is Jesus is crying out as he's teaching in the temple. And he says, You know me and you know where I am from. I have not come on my own, but the one who sent me is true. And you do not know him. I know him because I am from him, and he sent me. In verse chapter 14 is right, right before his passion. And he's expressing these things again to his disciples. This Philip is like, you know, asking him questions. Are you going to show us, you know, the Father and, uh, and we'll be satisfied? So this is kind of the context here. Um, and Jesus begins to teach, teach him. He says, I have been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who, who dwells in me does, does his work. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because the works themselves. And he did all these great things that, that should have been obvious that he had the power of God. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes me will also do the works that I do. And in fact, will do greater works than these because I am going to the Father. And then scroll down to verse 15. He says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And then in verse 21 he says, They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father and I will love them and reveal myself to them. And then verse 23 he says, Jesus answered them, Those who love me will keep my words, and my Father will love them, and we will come to him, to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. So, Jesus, while he was here, made it very clearly and abundant that he was not just bringing something new. He was bringing to the people the very teachings of God. The very words and the way that God wanted man to live. That's what he was teaching. And the authority that he had um, was because it was from God and the proof there when he was living was, it, you know, look at, look at my works at least. Um. And in the time of the writer of Hebrews, it's still, there still obviously were people who had questions about these things. And if not questions about Jesus as the leader of the faith, at least questions uh, of doing everything that Jesus said or holding to what Jesus said. And, and he goes through the book of Hebrews. Um, but what I, I want to do is just, with that said, is just give a warning. And I just want to read some warning passages here. But G Jesus was not joking about keeping his commandments. Okay? I mean, like, Jesus was very serious. The reason he came was to teach these things. We know also when he died, he broke the power of him who had us in chains. But, I mean, Jesus, in the fullness of time, this is what mankind was waiting for this teachings of Jesus and we as humans I think are easily turned aside from you know off the narrow road to this way or off the narrow road to this way and we need to be careful um, 
wherever we are and whoever we are, to, to not, not be turned away from the teachings of Jesus. And that everything that we consider as valid or, or viable to put in practice in my life needs to be compared with his teaching. There is a major, major teaching going around that is, is to the destruction of the souls of those who would be found in this situation. The teaching is against the permanency of marriage. And it's very serious and plain people all over this country and the world are falling into it. And I'm not going to teach on it, but Jesus taught that from the beginning God intended a man and a woman that they were married when they were married the first time. And that whether, if somebody went and walked into sin or whatever and left, that, that there was to be reconciliation, but that for sure, in God's eyes, those people were married. Whether, whether a married husband and wife were living together and one of them went and, and started committing act of adultery with the neighbor and he just came home, that's adultery. That man is in adultery. But they're still married, and they would be recognized as marriage. But if a godless country gives that couple a certificate that says they're divorced, that does not change the fact that they're still married. Okay, but there's a doctrine that's teach, teaching that no, and why? Where does it come from? The Old Testament law. The law of Moses that was fulfilled in Jesus' teaching. And anyways, there's other things we need to be careful. I mean, we can get sidetracked on, on many things. I mean, we can pick up a, a book and then be sucked into some sort of theology that, that makes this something like a pet theology. And we start defending this thing that may be just some theological bent that we, you have. But we don't know for sure or an opinion about this or an opinion about that. But then there's books and books written about this opinion. And before long, we can be sucked off or we're not going to have fellowship with this group or that group because they don't hold to this particular viewpoint on this particular subject. But, it, but that subject does not have to do with the teachings of Jesus. Are you following what I'm saying? I mean, that is how false teaching comes in. And I just, I want to read... 2 Peter chapter 2, some of it, and I want to read Jude, just, just as a reminder for us, wherever we're at, whether we're here, or whether we're traveling around and, and visiting brothers or sisters, or we're with family or whatever, we need to be on guard about false prophets and false teachers being around or being with us. And if people come to us and they... They express a wholehearted view that, yeah, they, they want to follow Jesus, they want to walk with us, but they're not willing to hold to all of Jesus' teachings. These two, I mean, this has to be addressed, and if it's not addressed, the, what, what is described here in chapter 2 will begin to start happening. And it's kind of like making apple cider vinegar. Like when a little bit of false prophecy comes in and it, it sneaks in, it's like that little yeast that starts... It just starts real small. And it may take years, but what ends up happening is it ends up turning the water that has a little bit of the yeast in it to this other thing that is not what it was originally intended to be. Um, but for the one who put the yeast in the water, it's exactly what it turned out to. Satan wants to put the yeast of false doctrine in the kingdom of God. Okay, so Second Peter... Chapter 2 says this, But false prophets also arose among people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive opinions. They will even deny the master who bought them, bringing a swift destruction on themselves. Even so, many will follow their licentious ways. And because of these teachers, the way of truth will be maligned. And not all of these false teachers are going to bring stuff that is going to look licentious. 
Okay. So, I mean, he's, he's addressing particular issues, but, but they're, what they're doing is introducing heresies. Uh, in their greed, they will exploit you with deceptive words. Their condemnation pronounced, uh, their condemnation pronounced against them long ago has not been idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Uh, for if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of deepest darkness to be kept until the judgment, and if he did not spare the ancient world, even through, though he saved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, when he brought the flood on the world of the ungodly, and if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes he condemned them to extinction and made them an example of what is to come to the ungodly and if he rescued Lot. Okay, so anyways, he's giving these, these examples. On and on. Verse 9. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trial and to keep unrighteousness under punishment until the day of judgment, especially those who indulge their flesh in depraved lust who despise authorities, bold and self-will, they are not afraid to slander the glorious ones, whereas angels, uh, though greater in might and power, do not bring accusations, them a, a slanderous judgment from the Lord. These people, however, are like irrational animals, mere creatures of instinct, Born to be caught and killed, they slander what they do not understand. And when those creatures are destroyed, uh, they will also be destroyed, suffering the penalty for wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reviling in their dissipation while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery and insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts turned in greed. Accused children, they are left, they have left the straight road and gone astray. Found the road of Balaam, son of Be Bezor, and loved the wages of wrongdoing, but was uh, but he was rebuked for his own transgression. And a speechless donkey spoke with a human voice, restrained the prophet's madness. These are waterless springs and mists driven by storm. That means there's not a lot of substance. Like when a big rain cloud comes, and it it looks like it's going to be a whopper and it doesn't deliver any rain. It's, it's an empty storm. That's what he's just referring to. For them, the deepest darkness has been reserved. For they speak bombastic nonsense with licentious desires of the flesh. They entice people who have just escaped from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For people are slaves to whatever masters them. For if, after they have escaped the defilement of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overpowered, the last state has become worse for them than the first. Okay, turn to Jude. And I, I just want to be clear that that's very clearly much more in I, identifying the false doctrines of the evangelicals that say, you know, you can just believe this and live in sin and stuff. But the point is that there is false prophecy coming and will come. And here's what Jude says about this. Beloved, while eagerly preparing to write to you, about the salvation we share, I find it necessary to write and appeal to you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. 
For certain intruders have stolen it has stolen in among you people who long ago were designated for the condemnation as ungodly who pervert the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny the only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. The point is, Jesus Christ came from God to teach mankind God's ways. Jesus, in the teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, did not use nuance. He did not use metaphors and just kind of throw it out there for people to figure out. He was very clear and very forthright with the way of God's kingdom. And we need to be as familiar with what Jesus taught as the those who were right there at the beginning, and we need to stand on that and contend for the faith that was one time for all history delivered. We need to examine ourselves, see if we might drift away from that. We need to examine others. We need to ask questions. I just... I mean, even this week, I heard about a man who, who I thought was right with us who holds to this erroneous view of marriage and divorce. I mean, it, it really was sad when I heard this. I would have had no idea, but I just, I just assumed that he accepted all of Jesus' teachings. I didn't ask him. I mean, like, I was... It really affected my day. I mean, when I heard that, Norman called me and shared this information with me. I was just shocked. And I guess I just, it just real, it, it dawned on my mind. We really do have to communicate with people. I mean, we just really need to know where they're at and find out what is the, what is the foundation Or what do they consider the foundation of the faith? Does it line up with what the Bible in the New Testament teaches the foundation of the faith is? What is the underpinnings of the kingdom of God and the way of Jesus? And anyways, that's my encouragement for the day. That's, That's all I have to share. I just wanted to encourage us to contend for the faith. Um, Whether... I mean, and just like Jesus says, you know, pick up your cross. When we communicate and we find these things out, um, we, we do encounter a cross because people feel their, their feelings get hurt or they, they turn away from us or they may not like us. Then. But that's just the way it goes. And the truth is that that's the most loving thing anyway for whoever we, we talk with. Because if they really don't understand the kingdom of God, they're in serious trouble. And especially, I mean, somebody who just outright rejects it is in a way safer situation than the person who thinks that he's right with God but will not accept Jesus' teachings. That person is in serious, serious danger because they have deceived their minds to thinking that they're okay. And, uh, And it's really serious. So... I'll just open it up. Any corrections or thoughts that someone would like to share? Um, and then we'll, we'll close in prayer. Maybe Leroy could close us in prayer after things get shared. The gospel following the Sermon on the Mount was simply Jesus living out what he taught that day, and that was that alone, I think, made him the Messiah exactly by what he said. And, uh, and then everything the New Testament followed with the letters and acts 
was a testimony to what the world did with that message. In the Old Testament, in my opinion, although I'm not completely familiar with all of it, just seems to be testimonies of wisdom and God's mercy. If you look in the Gospels, like if you try to find the truth in your faith and the letters in the Old Testament before you just go to the Gospel and let that take higher priority, you know, I think that opens a gate to... Uh, you know, it's a dangerous gate to a easier road and better path, and the way is narrow and difficult because it doesn't take much to figure it out. You just have to hold to it. I uh, appreciate uh, the message. Uh, I really enjoy Hebrews also. I, I enjoy it the way how it, it repeats a little bit of uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. This, I mean, the kingdom teachings. It just really opens it up for people who, who try not to carry that baggage anymore or, or let it go and, and just look at it as it is. Um, this, this, what you were just saying there in Second Peter's where it said that uh, it would have been better for them not to remember or even to know because it just fulfills what is talked about to them in Proverbs that they return as a dog returns back to its vomit. They went, went, went away from that straight and narrow road to the curve road. Um, I've had an opportunity to, to visit with some of my friends from high school and find out that some of them saw the narrow road and... Um, had taken a, a path that led them away from it, and it just sorrowed my heart knowing that they were on the right road but chose to go away from it. I appreciate the message. And <clears throat> it's a double blessing for Brother Nicholas's lesson and Brother Steve's, and I'm looking forward to the third one of taking communion and even a fourth of fellowship after that. And Brother Nicholas uh, used that word baggage too, Jason, that he's kind of apologizing that he doesn't have a college degree or education, and that is baggage and the wisdom of the world. And you very humble lesson, Nicholas, and good example for, some, for me and others that have had college. And appreciate your lesson. And Brother Steve's was excellent, I thought, and edifying. And wait till he gets into the let us, the let us admonitions, and that's serious serious things there, and, and I was just blessed to be here. A young man I talked with up in Kansas City, and he had a question you know, he's kind of into conspiracy theory, you know, like, uh, what if, you know, the Bible it has been corrupted over the years, you know, at these kind of questions. But I, I, I was reminded of what I told him. I said, I, I, I do think that the Bible is the, one of the greatest or the greatest tool that Satan has used to lead people, or to to uh, keep people away from the kingdom of God, because he does use scripture, and he, he did when Jesus was here uh, to tempt Christ, and and we might as well not deceive ourselves into thinking that he doesn't use it now, and I think he has, and will. So, anyway. That young man was a, a blessing to talk to. I mean, he had that. I was just reminded of that. But he, uh, I told him many Christians, you know, many people that call themselves Christians nowadays in America, 
And then he finished it for me. He didn't even... I might have paused a little bit, but he said, are not Christians. <laughs> because they don't do what Christ taught. So, anyway... One comment I forgot when Father Nicholas's lesson when <clears throat> his mom and his parents said, behave, behave, and it brought me back because I was the youngest of four, spoiled brat, and they used to say, and I used to hear it in my 20s, and my wife can use it to me now sometimes, but they would always say, my parents would say, grow up, Robert, grow up. When are you going to grow up? And I can say it now in front of all your brethren who I love, but it bothered me, and the time is near. Let's be serious. We press on. The time is near, and get serious. And so I, I still got to grow up and press on. <laughs>